Welcome back to Mark Latham's Outsiders. Now, a few weeks ago when I was in Toronto, Canada, I recorded an interview with a very important person, Professor Jordan Peterson, the preeminent academic around the world pushing back against political correctness and language control. So many of our viewers have said, get Jordan Peterson on. So by popular demand, here's that pre-recorded interview with a very, very important man doing great work. Well, Professor Jordan Peterson from the University of Toronto, thanks for joining us on Mark Latham's Outsiders. Uh, you're certainly doing a great job in pushing back against political correctness. Where do you think this insidious form of language control has come from? And why has it emerged so quickly in recent years to dominate political debate? Well, you know, I don't think it's emerged recently. I think it's been emerging in bits and pieces for a very long period of time. Uh, I think the, the initial fundamental boost, at least insofar as the campuses were concerned, was in the 1960s when the you know, when there was a real upsurge of, of leftist sentiment, let's say. Now, you know, that was driven, we, we should be clear about this, that was driven by some real concerns, this, the civil rights movement, for example, and also by young people's concerns about being shipped off to what was at least a very brutal and, and hard to understand war. And so then the, the, the universities took a real tilt towards political activism in the, in the 1960s and early 70s. And the campuses and the professors got radicalized. And then there was another real leap forward from a conceptual perspective in the 1970s, because Marxism per se had pretty much become, um, what would you say, discredited as a consequence of the catastrophes that it had produced in places like the Soviet Union and Maoist China. And so by the 70s, even if you were a French intellectual, you couldn't have your head stuck so far in the sand that you could still be an apologist for Stalin. But what happened then was that the, the Marxist types went, they, they reconfigured their theory and, and rebranded it in some sense as postmodernism. That's a bit of an oversimplification, obviously. But And then instead of the working class against the bourgeois, it became the oppressed versus the oppressor, and everything was was read through that lens, and that was really a consequence of the contributions of people like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault and, and their coterie of French intellectuals. And so that became intellectually respectable again in the 1970s, a lot through the efforts of the Yale, Yale University English Department. And then there was another big move forward in the 1990s. Political correctness was a big deal for about three or four years in the early 1990s, but it sort of faded away. And I think that was partly because the U.S. economy started to boom and people just weren't so, they were interested in other things. But, but as this entire time period progressed, the university professors and administrators became more and more radically leftist, I would say, and now that we're seeing the full fruit of that over the last five years. So it's been a long time coming, unfortunately. Yeah, but it seems to be reaching a, a climax now. You mentioned uh, French intellectuals, Foucault, uh, post-structuralist Marxism and the like. Do you think political correctness is in a perverse way a sign of the weakness of the left, that having tried to control economic means of production, uh, social services, the role of government, and those projects having collapsed in large part because of the fall of the Berlin Wall, that the left has had to move from structural issues of how societies run into things like behaviour, feelings and language control expressed through political correctness. So, so this is almost well, like for the that, left, the, their last their last It's an interesting way of hope. looking at it. You know, I mean, I do think that the, the Marxist rebranding under the postmodernist guise was definitely a consequence of the of of the intellectual unsustainability of any defense of any pro pro prolonged defense of, of Marxist uh, politics, philosophy, and economics. So, and then I also think that the attempt by the the the, um, the postmodernist social constructionists, in per in particular, to attempt to enforce a social constructionist view of gender and other such things by law is also a consequence of the fact that they've absolutely lost the battle from a scientific and philosophical perspective. I mean, no self-respecting scientist with any genuine scientific training believes for a moment that every element of sexually, um, so sex, sex associated behavior, the differences between men and women can be attributed to, uh, to socialization. I mean, no one, no one credible has believed that, I would say, 
So you see a link then between Since identity the 80s, politics. Would you see a link between identity politics and political correctness? That identity politics trying to get young people in particular agitated and uprising about their identities. Uh, it's, it's, it's one side of the coin. And on the other, you've got political correctness using the language control as uh, a way of uh, creating identity agitation. Oh yeah, I think there, I think there there are expressions of the of the same underlying phenomena. You know, um, I, I've often recommended to to my listeners a book by Stephen Hicks called "Explaining Postmodernism," which I would recommend to your listeners as well. If it's a, I, mean, I, I think it's quite a good book. The first chapter is particularly instructive; doesn't take long to read. That's "Explaining Postmodernism" by Stephen Hicks, and that mm -hmm. that does a nice job of describing the philosophical territory from which all of this is emerging, in, in my estimation. You're so, doing a, a great role on social media in, uh, in in pushing back against political correctness. How did how did it start? For the benefit of the Australian audience, how did it start for you here in Canada on this debate about um, C16? In September yeah, of well, last there, year, there was that, yeah, well, there's a bill that was that was being put forward at the federal level, purporting to merely add gender identity and gender expression to the list of protected groups, the groups protected by the Canadian Human Rights Act, and also to make uh, discrimination and harassment on those grounds something that you could be prosecuted for under the hate crimes provision of the criminal code. And you know that in itself doesn't sound particularly reprehensible, except for the fact that. It's very difficult to define such things as gender expression in particular, which, which really boils down to not much more than fashion choice, even in the terminology of the people that are pushing it. But the pernicious thing about that is that the bill was to be interpreted in light of policies that had been established by a provincial um, uh, uh, agency called the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and they're definitely possessed to the nth degree by postmodern ideology. And the the surrounding policy within guidelines within that would, would have been used to interpret Bill C-16 are absolutely dreadful. And one of the funny things that happens, happened actually is that the federal government had originally linked directly to the Ontario Human Rights Commission website to describe how this new legislation would be interpreted. But when the publicity about Bill C-16 started to become somewhat politically intolerable, they took that link down to hide what they to hide the connection between the two, the two, which I think was really scandalous. But anyways, I made a video about Bill C-16 after reading the Ontario Human Rights Commission website, trying to explain why the, why the legislation was so muddle-headed and pathological, even for the people that it purported to protect, because it basically forces into law the assumption that, gen that, that biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual proclivity are very independently and are all fundamentally a uh, consequence of socialization, you know, with the, with the mm -hmm. possible exception of, let's say, anatomical differences between men and women. And mm -hmm. um, the problem with that perspective, apart from the fact that it's just simply wrong, both statistically and, and factually, is that one of the strongest arguments that gay people and transgender people use to justify the, their, 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 their existence, let's say, but certainly their existence as valued citizens and the fact that rights should be extended to them is basically a biologically determinist argument, which is, well, you know, I was born this way. Homosexuality is a biological phenomena, as is transgenderism. And I'm not saying that that's canonical truth, nor that it's true in every case, but it is a very powerful argument, and it has been used very frequently by people who've been putting forth claims that uh, sexual proclivity and identity should be um, considered part of the broad expression of, of intrinsic humanity and protected in that way. But this new legislation just guts that because it insists, A, that such things are at most socioculturally constructed with no biological basis whatsoever, and at minimal or even more extremely, nothing but the kind of whim that can change entirely subjectively on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I looked at the legislation and I thought, not only was it a threat to free speech, partly because it, it um, impelled people to use certain types of address, the preferred pronouns that, that the radical postmodernists have been making up, but also did nothing to advance the cause of the very people that it was supposed to be helping. So I made a video about that and I released it on YouTube back in September and that created a political firestorm that really hasn't subsided 
in the eight months since it was released, which is, you know, absolutely beyond belief to me. It's beyond my understanding that that could be the case, but it certainly has happened. Well, you're fighting a great fight. And why do you think uh, there are so few academics willing to take this stance? I know there's a lot of pushback and abuse on social media. Have you found that intimidating? Why haven't you got more academic colleagues pointing out the, the common sense that you've been articulating? Well, there's a couple of reasons, I think. And one is that academics, especially the scientific types, tend to be, especially the scientific types, tend to be rather apolitical. And they would rather that ignore all this, let's call it nonsense, although there's more to it than that, and concentrate on their research and on their students and their teaching, which is what they're supposed to be doing. And when things are functioning properly, that's actually not a bad attitude. So the the bio, biologists and so forth just aren't taking this kind of threat seriously enough, but they will because it's coming their way. So that's reason one. Reason two is the general tendency of people, academic and otherwise, to keep their head down if there's a battle. You know, I mean, people, uh, one of my colleagues expressed it very well to me just before I made the first video, which was, well, I could stand out and say something but the personal cost to me would be overwhelming and the social benefit would be negligible. Now, I think that's a, that's, that's a defensible stance from a logical perspective, but I think that it has a serious flaw, which is why I decided to go ahead and make the video, which is that the only people that can ever speak out against developing oppression um, are individuals. And you pay a price for remaining silent, just like you pay a price for speaking. And I believe that the price for speaking is much lower than the price for remaining silent. So, but most people don't share that viewpoint. It's really funny though, watching this, because there has been a handful of academics who've spoken up, like uh, Camille Paglia and Christina Hoff Summers and um, Gad Saad and J Janice Fiamenko in Canada. And they've been going on the attack. They're not they're not on. They're not in defensive mode, right? They're actually bringing the fight to the postmodernists, and those people are doing just fine al along with me. Like it seems more that if you wait for people to ferret you out in your burrow and expose you, then you're really looking for looking to be stripped naked and whipped in public. But if you take the fight to the people that might come after you, then you have a much higher probability right. of winning. Right. It's better to be proactive. Well, I agree with that. Can I just say uh, I've got a 14 year old son who's crazy about memes. And I'm always joking with him that I'm a meme expert when, of course, I'm not. I know nothing about it. And I'm fascinated by your use of memes here or commentary about them, these characters, Keck and Pepe. What's it all yeah. about, Professor? Well, there's a bunch of things up with that. I mean, the first is that for whatever reason, I've been drawn into in this, that particular element of, of this sort of thing for a variety of reasons. I'm very interested in symbolism. And you know, I have a very large number of lectures on YouTube um, about 250 hours worth that discuss the psychology of symbolism and religious belief. And so the use of this new iconography is really extraordinarily interesting to me. And the, the phenomena of this strange little frog called Pepe, um, who's been identified as a hate symbol by no less than Hillary Clinton, I think is really fascinating because, um, because the Pepe symbol is a form of satirical protest, as far as I can tell more than anything else. And, um, so I've been following that and studying it, and I'm interested in the frog symbolism. I did a lecture with, or a, a um, YouTube video with a carver of orthodox icons named Jonathan Pajo on the metaphysics of Pepe, which people could watch if they're interested in this. But um, I'm, in, I'm, I'm curious about the, the manifestations of protest that are emerging collectively online because because they seem to be taking the form of a giant satirical protest. And I don't think we've necessarily seen anything like that before. So I think that's absolutely fascinating. And there's a strange twist to it that's also dragged me in. As um, people had been noting for a number of years, I've had videos online since 2013, that my voice is reminiscent of Jim Henson's Muppet uh, <laughs> Kermit the Frog. Right. And so I made a joke comical video, although it was very serious and intent, um, noting this resemblance and putting myself forward, strangely enough, as spokesfrog uh, warning about 
political correctness. And that also got me more tangled up with this frog symbolism issue that's been circulating around this symbol of Pepe. It's very complicated and, and, and strange, but that's that's a relatively brief answer to the question. OK, I'll get, so, my, I'll get my son to give an assessment of that as well. He's, uh, he's right into it. But I think it's great. You're able to communicate with younger people that way. It's very important. Well, because we the other thing these. that strangely happened is that I've become a target for these memes. So, for example, on this on this uh, on we websites quite well known Reddit. Of course, everybody knows about Reddit. There's a subreddit devoted to memes about me. Strangely enough, and uh, they're God. There must be 300 of the bloody things by now. And basically, what they do is cut pictures of me or things that I've said and put them in little, like cartoon posters and that sort of thing. And so that's also been extraordinarily strange. And I've been watching that develop and with a fair bit of amusement, I would say more than anything else, because the kids that are doing it, they're mostly young men. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, at least in relationship to me, don't seem to be doing it maliciously. And like, I've got nothing against people having a sense of humor. And you could use a sense of humor when you're dealing with you know, with, with people yeah, yeah. who are fundamentally politically correct, for example. So yep. that's been another side issue of the meme war, let's say. It's a, it's a very peculiar sociological and psychological phenomena, and it's been very interesting to watch and, and to participate in to some degree. Well, Jordan, you've got lots of supporters in Australia really taking notice of your work in social media, and we'd love to know what plans have you got for the future? You're keeping up the fight. Well, you know, um, one of the things that I'm planning to do is, apart from continuing to produce YouTube videos, I'm doing one right now, a series of lectures on the psychological significance of the Bible. And I see that as the cornerstone to the introduction of high quality humanities education um, on a global on a global basis. And that's something that I want to work on pursuing over the next few years. I've been talking to a business partner of mine who's a very good computer programmer and to a number of financiers and other academics and educators about the possibility of starting um, starting the process of putting extremely high quality education in the humanities and literature online as an alternative to these deadened uh, cult-like Marxist humanity slash postmodern uh, offerings that the universities have. I mean, I see the universities as they're too expensive. They're too administratively top-heavy. They, they're too overburdened by law. They've abandoned their central commitment to, to, to knowledge. They're not teaching people how to write. They're putting them in debt. In the United States, they're putting them into debt in ways that you can't, uh, you can't remove through bankruptcy. And so you're, you're, the price of your second-rate humanities education in the United States is increasingly a large student debt that you can't shake for the rest of your life. To me, that's all indicative of a system that's on its last legs. And so one of the things I really want to do over the next, let's say, three to four years is to start developing what would be the online equivalent to a humanities, a classic humanities institute. And, and uh, I want to put a lot of time and effort into that. Wow. So I've got that in the biblical series. I've started a series of discussions with um, Muslims, uh, the first one was with Ayan Hirzi Ali, who I interviewed on Thursday, but I want to do a regular series to have a discussion about Islam and about how it, what it's, how it can exist in relationship to the West, whether it can exist in relationship to the West peacefully, and how that might be attained and what might, and, and, and what the options are. You know? Yeah, no, so, well, that sounds absolutely vital. We wish you every success with that. Professor Jordan Peterson, thanks for talking to Mark Latham's Outsiders in association with Rebel Media, and we will watch your work with ongoing fascination. Many thanks. Well, thanks very much, and, and hello to everybody in Australia.